we have the pleasure to introduce Miriam Jaspierowicz Arman. She was born of concentration camp survivors in post-war Germany. Then her family emigrated to America in 1962. She was educated both in the United States of America and in Europe, and has lived and taught in many parts of the world, including, shall I name it? <laughs> Israel, Italy, Hungary, Switzerland, Ukraine, Poland, Romania, Russia, Slovenia, Mexico, etc. South in America. 1982, she founded the Music Culture Visions International, a company that she led until 2008. During that time, she wrote, directed, and hosted, and produced various radio and television shows in the United States and in, and in Europe. In 1999, Miriam authored the international bestseller on vocal technique, the voice, a spiritual approach to singing, speaking, and communicating, with uh, several editions and translations even in uh, German and Italian. Miriam's reach, uh, teaching career spans over 35 years. Her book, Soul Reflections, a personal odyssey in poetry and painting was published and released in 2003. Then in 2007, her book, Coming Home, outlines her arrival and life in the Lubavitch community of Crown Heights in New York, which features her speeches in political arena as well as illuminates a deep recognition and salutation of her spiritual values. In 2008, she moved to Uruguay and uh, published her innovative work on autism. Then from 2010 to 2012, Miriam taught at the Beit Sefer Hamerkazi Shel Kazanu, which is the central school for cantorial music. Her book, Revealed the Secret Codes of the Voice in the Sohar, is the culmination of her four previous books, The Voice. So we are the pleasure to <laughs> listen to your talk here, um, yeah. and then we'll have some time for questions as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, it's a pleasure to be here. Tremendous pleasure to be here. Um, we're in the festival of Passover, and I arrived two hours before the Sabbath and Passover, which is a very unusual occurrence that every single holiday this year in Judaism comes out on a Sabbath. We are talking about Tehillim. Our subject is what is the importance of Tehillim, the Psalms, in Judaism? It's very interesting that Joe Aquilina, the gentleman who, I don't know, I, I, I don't know, but whatever, he's like an angel. Um, yeah. Um, brought me here. And he said just before that... The Psalms are a bridge between Christianity and Judaism. And I said, if people were to understand how incredibly powerful Psalms are, there would be no strife in the world. Because we look at Psalms as something from then. But it isn't something from then. It's as pertinent today, in language of today, than it was 
in the times of King David, in the times of Asaph, in the times when the Psalms were written. I know you know the Psalms. So I wanted to bring something very special that probably, maybe, you don't know. And Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, 17, 1732, 1810, that was an innovator but not an innovator like we think today of, you know, another piece of electronics, <coughs> something, iPad, Apple, something, no. He was an innovator of thinking of how to relate life then, which is life now, to what is written and what is being brought forward in Psalms. I'm going to tell you some things that are generally not discussed by a woman, especially in the company of men. But I decided to do this because I wanted you to have something, a perspective of something that these particular psalms will do. Now you might want to write the number of the psalms, which are 16, 32, 41, should I wait? 16, 32, 41, 42, 59, 77, 90, 105, 137, and 150. You know that the Psalms are divided into a month, and every day we read a certain number of Psalms in order to finish at the end of the month. We have and we carry with ourselves <coughs> major, major klipa. The word klipa means something that is covered or something covering, and in this particular case is evil. So we carry around with ourselves evil just like we carry around with ourselves good. Meaning, there is an evil inclination, and then there is a good inclination. And they are at constant odds with each other. What is it that you want from me? Oh, I only want milk in my coffee. But you can't have milk in your coffee because the milk is not kosher. What do you mean the milk is not kosher, but how can you drink black coffee? Yeah, but black coffee is kosher, and kosher is not with milk. All right, then cream. Can I have cream? In the hotel, there were, there were these little packets which were half and half, and I went looking around, <clears throat> trying to find maybe there was something something that I could possibly have the coffee with that little thing to make it taste better. And then I said, you know, 
first of all, you wouldn't have it under normal circumstances mm -hmm. because it's not kosher and it doesn't have a label. Now, on top of everything else, it's Passover, where this whole stuff, everything that was okay during the year is now not allowed because it's not kosher for Passover. Speaks the good inclination against the evil inclination, saying, ah, why should this even come up in conversation? You know the answer. However, the evil, the klipa, is after us continually. And when you have certain thoughts during the day, those thoughts come out at night. And then since sleeping is one sixtieth of death, these thoughts come back up again, and in men, they cause certain physical things to happen. Now, in Judaism, those particular things that would happen are actually considered to be murder. Because therefore, a soul is not coming down, taking a body, and becoming a human being. And what happens is that the klipa comes around, catches on to that, and remains evil. Rabbi Nachman took the combination of those psalms that I gave you before, and he found in his relationship with God that these psalms are an absolution for this particular happening, for this particular malady, for this particular occurrence. Whether or not the occurrence is okay, and you really didn't think about it, and it happened because of a physical reaction, or is actually the outgrowth of evil thoughts, or negative thoughts, or lascivious thoughts, or whatever. So, the conversation of those ten songs, those ten psalms, are in correlation with the, the ten songs in the Bible. Now, I can't go into them because we don't have the time, but I'm going to tell you what they are. There are ten songs in the Bible, various times during the writing of the Bible, and they start off with Mizmor le Shabbat. Mizmor le Shabbat means a song for the Sabbath day. You all know that because you study ancient Hebrew, so forgive me. The second one is called Shir Hayam, the Song of the Sea. Song of the Sea, tremendously important. Why? Because when, and we're in this particular time, when God split the sea, Moses, sang, and the Jewish people sang the song of the sea to be in deep, deep gratitude for being saved from the Egyptians who were coming after them. And then Miriam led 
the women a second time in the Song of the Sea. The Shirat HaBe'er. Shirat HaBe'er is the song of the well. Hazinu. Listen. Before Moses died, he said to the people, Hazinu. Listen to what I have to say. Listen to what you need to do. Listen to what God wants from you in future times. Listen to what your history and what your people are going to be. So the Shir of Hazinu, which comes at the end of Moses' life, is comparative to the psalm. Then comes the song of Give on the valley of Jerusalem. You know, then comes the song of Dvora, the prophetess. Then comes the, so the, the song of Hannah, the mother of Samuel, exactly. Then comes the song of David, which is mentioned twice. Then, of course, comes the song of songs, which we all know, which is really the story of the Jewish people in their relationship with God. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine, is me. In other words, you're talking about an intricate relationship between what happens above and what happens Below. And the tenth song is the song of Mashiach, the song of the Messiah, which is yet to be sung. And in which time we are at this time. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, it's my Rebbe, him, world, 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 renowned um, humanitarian, extraordinary, extraordinary human being, he said, the time of Mashiach, the time of the Messiah, is now. Take a piece of cloth and begin shining your buttons and get ready because this is the generation of Mashiach. And if you look at the world and if you read and if you just look around you and you're involved in a religious life, <clears throat> you see, prophecy, you see what is going on in the world, and you also realize that we're way, 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 way above or below the 49th level of <clears throat> let's say, evil inclination. Psalm number 137, I want you to hear it. I want you to hear it because I want you to get an idea of what, you know that there is Sephardic Judaism, which is Spain, Turkey, the whole area, basically Malta would probably fall into that area. And then there is the Eastern European, European, which is Ashkenazi. Okay. And here is the trop. The trop is the musical... Um, the musical line of the way it is thought that the Levites 
used to sing. And the Levites, the singers of the temple, are the key to my work with the voice. So on Thursday, I'm giving a talk in Summit Hall, not on Tehillim, but on the voice, and where the voice comes from and what the essence of voice really is, come and join because I think you will have a beautiful time. So here is Al Na'arot Babel Shamya Shavnu. Here at the shores of Babylon, there we sat after the temple was destroyed. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat and wept as we remembered Zion. On the willows there in her midst, we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us to sing. Those that scorned us asked us to be happy, saying, Sing for us the songs of Zion. How can we sing the song of God on foreign soil? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue cleave to my palate. 
if I do not remember you, if I do not place Jerusalem above my chief joy. Remember, O oh God, what the children of Edom did on the day of destruction of Jerusalem, saying, raise it, raise it completely to its foundation. All of what is the relationship between the Jewish neshama, the Jewish soul, and its creator is written in this one psalm. We're always sitting in Babylon, we're always in exile. Even though we have a land, we are still sitting with exile surrounding us and not giving us peace. How can I sing the song of God on foreign soil? I need to sing the song of God in my home. Where is my home? My home is Jerusalem. My home is my country. My home is my earth. My home is not a secular political entity. My home is my temple. My home is my Mount Zion, my home is the blessed land. That's my home. Every single thing that takes the voice of a person and makes it the power that it has of communication, of showing love, of showing care, of showing hatred, <coughs> of teaching. Whatever it is that the voice has to do is here and it says, I will close my throat. And when I close my throat, my tongue will close up my soft palate, and I am stuck. I can't bring out a sound. So the Levites, who were being asked to sing the greatest singers of the world, chosen by God to be the singers of the temple, were asked by their captors, sing! We love your voices. Make electronics. We love your electronics. Make gorgeous oranges. We love your oranges. But remember, you're slaves. You're captured. But sing. And they said, no, I can't sing. Because something is missing in my soul. Something that my voice brings out. Something that is the essence of me. Which is God cannot come out because everything is closed up. I am unable to sing the voice. I am unable to speak the voice, because singing and speaking is exactly the same thing. There comes a moment in a person's life when all of a sudden, and it can be right at the beginning, and it can be in the middle, and it can be the day of death, when you need to understand your connection with God. I'm Jewish. 
very Jewish and Orthodox. Bless you. But the humanity of Judaism and the humanity of the Psalms and the humanity of living in God's world. I mean, we're talking about a world which is God's world. We think it's ours. We don't have any idea of what this is. Does anybody ever talk about the horrible natural disasters in the world and say, wow, this is written in Tehillim. Wow, this is God's work. No. No conversation of God. God is out of the conversation of our humanity today. If you read Tehillim and you connect with the words of Tehillim. Now, for instance, I read Tehillim in English. The reason I read Tehillim in English, I read them in Hebrew, but I don't have the same connection. You probably read much, much better than I do because you're studying ancient Hebrew. And I don't, I have modern Hebrew, and it's extremely, extremely difficult because there's a lot of Aramaic in it. Now, if you make a mistake in reading a Hebrew word that is connected to God, which they all are, that's another conversation, a very, very deep one. What awaits you, what awaits you in Olam Haba, in the world to come, is really not a very happy place. Let's go there. So I don't want to make any mistake on anything in my tefillah, in my, in my reading of the Tehillim, because I want to be sure that what I'm saying and what I'm meaning and what I'm understanding and what is my connector is going to be absolutely perfect. When God gave the Torah to Moses, you know that Moses had a speech defect. And he had that defect until God used his system of speaking through him, and only then was the system fixed. Only then was Moses able to speak perfectly. So the word of God, the words of Hashem, must be spoken with the utmost caution and the utmost respect and the utmost connection and the utmost love because ultimately that is what he wants to hear. He loves music. He loves song. That is what he wants to hear. And it's only through prayer and it's only through song that we're able to arrive with our prayers on Kisei HaKavot, on the throne of glory. It's tremendous, tremendously important that when you say to Hillam that you concentrate and be completely and totally involved in every single word that you're speaking because you're talking to your father. You're talking to God. You're talking to the creator of the universe. What closer to your own soul 
can there be then the creator of the universe, the creator of your soul, the the giver of everything is your giver, is my giver, is the giver of the world. And whoever you are and whatever you need and whatever is your wish and whatever is your desire and whatever is your deepest heart's desire is written in Tehillim. There is nothing, 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 nothing left out of Tehillim. And you say to yourself, how come King David is having family problems? He's got problems with Saul. He's got problems with this one. He's got problems. Everybody's got problems. How come King David had problems like I have problems? Nothing has changed. Everything is the same. The clothing have changed, but the soul hasn't changed. Hashem created the world, He created the universe, He created the soul, and every moment of every day, He is creating and recreating every single solitary thing. You know, I travel all over the world, and I... I see so much, and I look at flowers, and I look at greenery, and I look at a leaf, and the Rebbe said, nothing is out of place, nothing is a coincidence, not even a leaf falls off the tree without out divine intervention. There is no such thing as a coincidence. Like I had to be here today to bring you whatever it is that you want to receive from me. It's what I'm receiving from you. And the whole thing is orchestrated completely God designs, God creates, God's words are the power of Tehillim. And if you read Tehillim, the way you read Tehillim and I read Tehillim, you begin to realize that there is greater greater than man, greater than politics, greater than all the universe. And that is only the power of God. And when the tenth song will be sung and there is completion in the world, we will be what God wants us to be, and that is soul brothers. All of us. Mm-hmm. All of us. And the nations will do what Hashem wants, and Jews will do what Hashem wants, and all of us will follow the law of God. Because when you follow the law of God, really follow the law of God, then there is no war, and there is no strife, and there is no hatred, and there are no problems, but there is a message, and the message is peace. The message is love. The message is yetziat Mitzrayim. We are going out of slavery. We're going out of the spiritual Egypt and we're going into the time of Mashiach 
and the total and complete acceptance of the law and the base of Tehillim. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. some questions. Please. Um, you place so much emphasis on the material word of the Tehillim. Would that apply to the, the rest of the Bible? That is the whole, okay. Of course. Of course. The whole, the whole conversation every single week. The Torah is a weekly portion, and every week we read a different portion. Every single week, in one way or another, God is giving us instructions, He's giving us laws, He's giving us um, things to do, and He says, if you do what I'm asking you to do, if you follow what I'm telling you, then you will have rain. You will have bounty. You will have joy. You will have a good life. Every week. And this is incredibly material. You know, when you start reading... The things of the Mishkan, okay, what he wants on the ark, and what color he wants, and how much gold he wants, and how much silver he wants, and what size it should be. It's amazing. I'm sitting there every week, and sometimes I'm learning, and I'm crying, because I'm thinking, nobody listens. Why isn't anybody listening? He's telling you every single thing. He's giving you instructions for your life. And you don't listen. We live in a material world. And God was materialistic because he brought it all on and he continues to bring it on. You understand? He, he, he totally, every single thing that is happening in the world is because God wants it to be. The world opened up with computers. Why? Because we need to know. We need to know the things that computers in the good sense can give us is wisdom, is knowledge. The things that computers can give us in the bad thing is again the conversation between good and evil, and you're constantly in a quandary, what is happening? Who are you? And there are moments when the material is so powerful that it takes a hold of you, and you forget who you are. When I came to live in America, uh, I, I was a religious girl. My family was very, very, very traditional. It was difficult in Germany. My parents are survivors, so it was difficult to be religious. <clears throat> when I came to America, I was sucked in. I wanted to be just like everybody else. I did not want to stand out anymore. I did not want to be different. I wanted to be accepted just like everybody else. And that went on for quite a while and it ripped, it ripped into my being. Basically, nothing except the high holidays. Material, material. Forgetting 
but not forgetting. Always being conscious of who I am, but inside, not externally. Externally, I was the material girl. Does that answer your question? What about the soul of the words then? Because if the Bible, if the words of the Tahirin are the words of God himself, of humanity, the words, that, um, the, the soul of the words themselves go much beyond the material words. In fact, we go to look up the real meaning of words, we, we, we discuss any differences in this word or in this word. What about the soul of the words? That my dear Reverend, brings us to a very deep subject. And for this, you're going to have to invite me again. <laughs> because to enter into the soul of the Word, to enter into the essence of the application of the word to the soul, to God, okay? That is a deeply Kabbalistic concept, which I'll be delighted to discuss and to teach, because my tenth book, the one that just came out, is called The Secret Revealed the secret code of the voice in the Zohar. And the voice and the Zohar and Hashem and the word are one. I'll give you one hint. Rabbi Shimon Ba Yochai, who is the author of the Kabbalah, says, there is no sound without utterance, and there is no utterance without sound. And the secret lies in that phrase, exactly like in the Tigla 137, it lies in if my throat closes, if my tongue adheres to my palate, and I can't bring out the word, I also cannot bring out good. I also cannot bring out evil. I am closed. And Hashem closes the word. When Hashem closes the word, the soul lives, but the word does not. One of my other books is on autism. And autism is the closing of the word. And many, many, many autistic people are unable to communicate verbally but in their minds, in their Hashem space, in the space that is God's space, where the thought of God exists, where the thought of God creates, where the thought creates word, where the thought creates sound. That's and that's, that's, <laughs> that's a big subject. It's a big subject, but you're 100% correct. Because the word and the soul and the place of God's presence inside us is that. Anyone else? Please. Would you think that Judaism at large, or the, the many br branches, the various branches of Judaism, um, are making enough use of, of Kabbalistic no. spirituality? No, 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 no. 
So it's not that widespread mm. yet, maybe? No, it's no, on, no. Is it on the increase, though? Uh, yes, it is, and it has been since the Baal Shem Tov. Mm -hmm. Basically, the Hasidic movement, okay, opened up the conversation of Kabbalah, opened up the conversation of the mystic part of the, to the Torah, which is <coughs> more than just a story, which is more than just a portion of the week, but there are ramifications and there are deep, deep, deep meanings to what is what. When you begin Ah, when you begin to study Kabbalah, you know, everybody says, oh, it's so, oh, it's just off the wall, just so difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, but after you've studied Torah, I don't know your Bible, but I know mine. So after you've studied Torah for a long time and deeply, I'm not talking about, you know, reading superficially. I'm talking about reading, reading commentary, understanding. And then you go and you begin to read Kabbalah. I'm not saying that you're going to get it right away, immediately, everything. But what you are going to get is a glimpse into infinity. And you begin to look at things and you begin to understand things in a non-material way. And you come enormously close to God's thought. I'll give you an idea. For example. Before God created the Torah, do we have to go? Before God created the Torah, he had a conversation with the Torah. And he said, I'm going to give this Torah to a bunch of nomads called the Jewish people. The Torah says, but why? You know they are going to sin against you. You know that they're going to do things that everything that I stand for, meaning the Torah, is not what's going to be. So Hashem answered the Torah and he said, at the same time, and before I give it, I have already created repentance. And that is called tshuva, the return. And repentance in Judaism is something incredible because any time, at any moment that you repent and you go to God with a broken heart, and a contrite spirit, which is to healing, totally to healing. He listens and he forgives because you repent. However, that is not to be confused with, well, I repented. And then I'm going and I'm having McDonald's cheeseburger. <laughs> you understand? Okay, I repented, but now I'm going and I'm having McDonald's cheeseburger. 
or uh, what is this kosher business? I'm in Malta. There is no kosher. Okay, eat fruit, eat vegetables. Make sure that you bring with you matzah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Repentance, also like everything else, is conditional. If you repent from the bottom of your heart and you really mean what you say, you're not going to go. And you're not going to have McDonald's cheeseburger <laughs> or other burger or Burger King or what or kebab or whatever. Okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm staying at the intercontinental. The food and the, 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 oh, I stayed in my room. I didn't want to go out. I didn't even want to smell it. You understand? But not because I'm being tempted. Because I pray every day, please God, don't tempt me. Because as powerful as I want to be, the Yitzhahara, the evil inclination, is after us continually. And to be strong enough to stand up and take the words of Tehillim and take them seriously to heart. Pleasure. Thank you for this. Well, I just want to thank Harry for this. But next Wednesday, this Wednesday, not next Wednesday, this Wednesday, we are organizing a talk at 7.30 at Robert Sumner Hall. The main aim is to raise funds for our project in Canada for the Serenians. Miriam has um, accepted that we charge a donation, donation fee and um, it goes, the government has just given us ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, of 10,000 euro. The Salesians are going to spend 13,000, but we are going to raise funds for 4,500 to build um, toilets and showers and a water hole for the orphans in Canada. So if you come and contribute a little bit, it will go to are raising funds. But the talk is not going to be about telling, it's going to be about the voice, how to produce the voice in a spiritual way. I mean, she thinks of the voice in a holistic way rather than in a mechanical way, vocal cords, breathing, you know. But she has, I think, something to contribute in, in, to our uh, understanding of singing and speaking and communicating in the sense that um, we have to think of our actions in a holistic manner. So we're not saying, I'm not saying Kabbalah, I'm not saying setting Jewish mysticism. <laughs> but what, I, what, we are, what we are doing is we are making available to the general public, I think, this opportunity to look at communicating in a holistic manner. So I invite you all and bring your friends to this interesting talk, not Thursday, but Wednesday, 27th. Thank you so much. Thank you.